Well, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Megan Evans and I'm with the Alberta Native Bee Council. And I'm really excited to be presenting on behalf of the Buzzworthy, uh, the Galt Museum's uh, new uh, exhibit on bees. So today I've broken up my presentation into a few different sections. Uh, first, we're going to talk about the diversity of insects in general. These poor little critters are often overlooked and they're super important to us. Uh, then we're going to talk about the diversity of bees. We're going to talk about their habitats. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the difference between managed bees and wild bees. So first, uh, I'm going to show you, this is a pie chart of global animal biodiversity. And each of these pieces of pie is made up of the number of species in each of these different animal groups. Um, so as, as you can clearly see, there are far more insect species than there are uh, of other animal species. Um, and so insects make up the, the vast majority of our animal biodiversity. And when we talk about biodiversity, this is truly what we mean. But when we talk about conservation of biodiversity, our focus becomes a little bit more narrowed, much more narrow and much more focused. Um, and we tend to ignore these really important insect uh, species. Okay, so these insects are really important to us as humans. Uh, I probably don't have to tell anyone here that uh, bees are pollinators and they're important because they pollinate plants. That's important in our natural ecosystems and it's also important in our agricultural ecosystems as well. Insects provide an important role in helping us cycle nutrients. So they break down organic matter, uh, they break down you know, your compost and, uh, and other types of organic matter. So it's really, really critical to us. They also provide pest control by eating other insects. Um, and along those same lines, insects are an incredibly important food source for many different animals. And even though individual insects are very small, the amount of biomass that they contribute into our food webs is tremendous. So insects are really, really important. Um, researchers in 2006 did a study and they estimated the value of these ecosystem services. So that's what we call all these things that insects do for us for free. Um, and they estimated that value to be about $57 billion a year just in the United States alone. And that's from 2006. So those, you know, those dollars will be much higher in today's figures. Um, but this just really showcases the importance and the value that insects provide to us as humans. However, insects are declining. It's drastic and severe. So for many, many years, uh, you, naturalists and researchers alike uh, were suggesting that insects were declining. And we were seeing this through a lot of anecdotal evidence where you know folks would be driving to their cottage like they had done every year for 50 years, and they didn't have to stop and squeegee their windshields anymore. And that's something that some of us have probably even noticed in our lifetimes. So, so there's a very, you know, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence suggesting that insects are declining, but we also now have strong empirical evidence that confirms that. So there's a couple, I've got a couple of examples here of studies that have been done. So the first one uh, was a German researcher who published in 2017 and found a 75% decline in insects over 27 years. So that was in abundance. So 20, a 75% decline in insect abundance over 27 years. That is incredible. Uh, this research was done in parks and protected areas in Germany. So those would arguably be some of their best habitats for insects as well. So, so these are very real declines that we're seeing. And um, more recently, a couple of researchers, uh, they surveyed all, all of the other research that had been done on the topic and they extrapolated and they, they suggested that 40% of our insect species are at risk of extinction over the next few decades. So this is really, really problematic. Um, these declines are real, they're severe, and the, really I don't think that this issue is getting enough attention and the attention that it deserves, especially when we know just how important these insects are to us. So that's my public service announcement about the importance of conservation of insects. Um, and you should tell everybody uh, that you know that insects are important, even though they're sometimes kind of gross or creepy, they're still really important. So we're gonna switch gears and we're gonna talk about bees now which are of course the, maybe the easiest insects to love in my personal opinion. So I have a quiz and uh, what I'm showing you here are a number of insect species. Um, and these are insects that we have right here in Alberta. And what I want you to do is have a look at the insects and I want you to figure out which ones are not bees. So they're all numbered, have a good look. I'll give you a couple of seconds to have a look and, uh, and uh, figure out if, if, uh, which ones of these are not bees. So the answer is that they're all bees. 
So this really, um, this is kind of mind opening for, for some people, mind blowing even. Um, you know, our bees come in all different shapes and colors and sizes, which you can see here. Um, these are bees that were, are found right here in Alberta. These are crazy tropical bugs or, you know, th these are bees that we have right here. And we have red bees and blue bees and striped bees and hairy bees and shiny bees and just, it's incredible. So these are all bees. And, and sometimes what we think of when we think about bees uh, it isn't necessarily the case. Um, and we'll, we'll talk more about that um, in a minute. So in Alberta, we have 321 native bee species on record, um, which is a lot. That's, that's an incredible amount of diversity. In fact, um, that's almost twice as many as all of the mammals, fish, amphibian, and reptile species combined. So it's a lot, it's a lot of different species. And of that 321, we have 28 bumblebee species. So it's interesting because bumblebees probably are what you think of when you think about bees, but they make up, I think, less than 10% of our native bee species. So we're gonna talk about, you know, what those other bees look like and where they live. Um, and of course you saw some of, them, some of those in the previous slide as well. We also have five non-native species on record. Um, and that includes species like the European honeybee. We're gonna talk about honeybees uh, in a moment as well. So here, this is, um, this is showing you the status of our bees in Alberta. So every five years, the federal government compiles the uh, wild species status report. So they list all of our wild species and assign a conservation status ranking. So in Alberta, about 50% of our 321 native bee species are doing okay. They're either secure or apparently secure. About a quarter are unrankable, and that's because they're data deficient. We simply just don't know enough about them to assign a conservation status ranking. And about another quarter are either rare or declining. So that, that, that's problematic. So when we look at this, this pie chart, about 50% of our bees are doing okay, and the other 50% are uh, data deficient or rare or declining. And, and we'll talk now about a little bit about the reason for some of those declines. So bees, um, bees are impacted by a number of things. One of them is habitat loss, and that is a big factor. So when we talk about habitat loss, I think it's important to define what good habitat is. And typically good habitat, or I, I guess I should say the best habitat um, are our native ecosystems that these bees evolved with. Those systems are always gonna provide the, the food resources in the form of pollen and nectar um, from flowers, as well as the nesting resources, which could be uh, we'll, we'll talk about the nesting resources, I'll leave that for a second. So these native ecosystems, take for example our native grasslands. Um, uh, grasslands are considered to be one of the most endangered ecosystems on the planet. And in Alberta and on the prairies, it's no different. Um, there's a very small percentage of our native grasslands remaining intact, and those grasslands are really great bee habitat. In many cases, we've converted those grasslands into habitats that are not so great for bees, um, including you know, some of our agricultural crops um, and agricultural systems, in addition to lots of other landscape um, disturbance. So, so habitat loss is a major factor for uh, native bee decline for sure. We know that pesticides can impact bees as well. You know, by their nature, they're designed to control pests, uh, insect pests. So, um, so pesticide poisoning can be a problem. Um, there are a whole suite of pests and pathogens, diseases, bacteria, fungi, mites that are gonna impact these bees, uh, much like they impact uh, humans, right? We have all sorts of things that impact us. Um, some of these things are, you know, things that the bees evolved with. So native you know, or diseases that they've been dealing with for many, many years and eons. Um, and, and, and the same is true for, you know, the, some of the pests and bacteria, mites, that sort of thing. So they have um, diseases, pests and pathogens that they've been dealing with for a long time. But then there is the introduction of novel diseases, pests and pathogens. And that's really problematic. And we can see that in what's happening with us right now with the global COVID-19 pandemic. This is a novel pathogen. We don't have any defenses against it. And that's why it's so severe and so problematic. The same is true for bees. When we introduce new diseases, they have no defenses against them. And that can be really problematic as well. So we have to be very careful that we're not doing that. And then, of course, climate change uh, is probably going to impact our bees as well. We don't fully understand exactly what that's going to look like. But, you know, it's likely that certain plant species might start blooming earlier. Uh, and that might go out of sync with when bees emerge. You know, we can expect species ranges to expand and contract, um, and those sorts of things. But yeah, climate change is definitely something we need to start thinking about um, with regard to bees and bee decline. 
Okay, so let's talk about bumblebees. So bumblebees really fit the bill for what we think of when we think about bees. And this is probably the image that comes to mind for people when they think about bees. Bumblebees are social insects, and that means that they are uh, that they have a queen bee, they have worker bees, and they have male bees. So the queen and worker, are, the queen and the workers are both female. The only difference is that the queen is larger in size, and she becomes larger by being fed more food and better quality food while she's developing. And this is important because she needs to have fully developed reproductive bits because her role is going to be to lay eggs and to grow colonies. The worker bees, um, as the name suggests, they do all the work. Um, so the worker bees, they go out, they collect the food, um, they perform nest hygiene duties, they'll feed the bees that are in the nest, uh, they'll fan the entranceway to the nest to cool it off. They do all sorts of things. So the worker bees are busy, there's a lot of work to be done in a bee colony. And then we have male bees. And well, male bees have a very important but singular role in the bee world, and that is to mate with the queens and then they die. So they have a very short lifespan, uh, but it is a very important uh, part of the bee uh, life cycle. So this is what um, uh, the bee life cycle looks like. So right now in Alberta, uh, it's currently very cold and it's hard to even think about bees in the dead of winter. Right now in Alberta, the only bumblebees that are here right now are hibernating bumblebee queens. So these queens are buried into the soil uh, or some other uh, insulating medium, uh, and they're essentially hibernating. So they're going to emerge in the spring, and as you might imagine, they'll be quite hungry. Um, so those early spring flowers are really, really important for bumblebee queens because they need to build up their energy reserves so that they can establish a nest. So in the wild, bumblebees are going to nest um, in cavities. So they'll nest in old rodent holes. They'll nest in like inside a, or underneath and in a tussock of grass, in a tree cavity, under a pile of down debris, or like if you've got a, a bunch of branches piled up in the backyard, they'll get in there and find a little space. Um, and that those are the, the areas where they're quite happy nesting in. So once the bee is, the queen bee has found a nest, she creates what we call a honey pot, and she creates this out of a waxy-like substance. She'll go and forage for pollen and nectar, and then basically store her honey in this little tiny honey pot. Then she lays eggs in, in a nest cell that she makes out of another waxy-like substance, um, and then she continues to do this. So she'll lay eggs, create nest cells, she'll go forage for food, fill up the honey pot, feed her bees. So this queen bee is busy trying to get that first brood of workers going. So um, in about three to five weeks, um, the workers will emerge and they'll leave the nest and they'll start doing the foraging and start helping the queen out with some of the other um, duties um, involved in the nest um, and growing the nest. And then the queen stays behind and she continues to lay eggs to grow the colony. Now the colonies can grow to be quite large. In fact, there's a bee colony that we have right here, which is one of the larger ones that I've ever seen. Um, and typically the size of the colony is going to be dictated by a number of factors, but one of the important ones is the amount of food. So if there's a lot of food, which are um, flowers in bloom, that, and that food is nearby, the colony can grow to be quite large. But if the bees have to fly a long distance and use a lot of energy to get that food, um, that, that's gonna limit the, um, amount of the amount of reproduction that's gonna happen in that colony. So food's a really important factor. So having lots of flowers nearby is really good for, for bumblebees. So as the season progresses, um, the queen is going to produce eggs that will become males and that will become new queens. So this is toward, this is August, you know, um, around August, late summer. Um, and once those bees emerge, um, they leave the nest, they mate, um, and at that point, everybody dies off. So the males die off, the old queen dies off, the workers die off, and the only bee that goes on over winter is that newly emerged, newly mated queen bee that will go find a place to hibernate and again, we're back at the beginning of our life cycle. So she's going to be the bee that's going to go on to start a new nest um, in the next year. So that is a bumblebee life cycle. And this is what the inside of a bumblebee nest looks like. So you can see that we have a queen bee here, and she's the large bee. We have worker bees. Um, we have um, uh, bees that are still developing in the, the closed nest cells. And then we have old nest cells that you can see have liquid in them. And this liquid is bumblebee honey. And that's what they will use to feed themselves. So you can tell by this image that there's not a lot of liquid in there. <laughs> this is, we can't harvest bumblebee honey just because they don't make the amount that would be needed. Um, and so it, it's really not feasible, but this is really important for them. This is what the inside of a bumblebee colony looks like. 
So we're going to talk quickly about two different bumblebee species, and these are pretty important bee species. So the first one is the western bumblebee, and this might be a bumblebee species that you might have heard of. So this used to be the most common bumblebee in all of western Canada, but over the span of about 30 years, it's gone from being the most common to becoming one of the most rare. So it's kind of fascinating, you know, what is impacting this particular species so much more so um, greatly than the others. And to explain what we think is happening, I'll have to give you a little bit of context. So we've learned that we can domesticate bumblebees for use in greenhouse pollination. So if, you're, if you run a greenhouse, you can buy bumblebee colonies, put them in your greenhouse, and those bumblebees will pollinate your peppers and your tomato plants. Um, and so we know that, and so this is, this is something that's done uh, and has been done for many, many years. And we used to utilize the western bumblebee for, as the bee for, for the greenhouse pollination. What we think happened was a disease spread through the managed bees and then spread to the wild bees. And I, there's been some research that have shown that this species along with a couple of others are more susceptible to that disease. And that's why we're seeing these really great impacts um, uh, and, and drastic declines of the Western bumblebee throughout its range. So it's very much a cautionary tale that we have to be very careful when we start you know, breeding, manipulating, handling, and moving these bee species around. Because again, we, we don't always know the, the, the full consequences of our actions. So the next bee that we're going to talk about is the gypsy cuckoo bumblebee. So this one has a bit of a silly name, but this is, this is not a regular bumblebee. This is a cuckoo bumblebee. And so this bee, she emerges a little bit later in the season. And instead of seeking out her own nest to start, she seeks out existing bumblebee nests. Um, she will invade the nest and duel, like essentially fight with the queen to the death. Um, and if the gypsy cuckoo bumblebee is successful, she will uh, start laying eggs and force the existing workers to rear her young and to go collect food and, 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 and rear, rear her offspring. So this sounds really awful. I mean, goodness, that sounds really extreme and nasty. But um, hopefully what I'll tell you next will make you feel a little bit better about it. So, so the image I just brought up, this is a regular bumblebee. Um, and as you can see, she is carrying pollen on her back leg. So she has a special adaptation on her back leg. It's, it's a smooth concavity and a fringe of hairs. And, 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 and bees, you'll actually see bees, bumblebees, grooming themselves um, when they're out foraging and packing pollen that they collect from all over their body into the, the, this little pollen ball on their hind leg. So you should watch for that when you're bee watching this summer and spring, because that's what everyone will be doing, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, so watch for that behavior and you'll see them packing the pollen into their back leg. Um, so, so they have this adaptation to do that. And that's how they bring the, the pollen uh, and nectar back to feed the rest of the colony. If you look at the picture of the gypsy cuckoo bumblebee though, she has a hairy leg with, she doesn't have a flattened concavity and she doesn't have a fringe of hairs. So she lacks the adaptation that's required for her to be able to, to, to go forage for food and bring it back to feed her offspring. So she's entirely reliant on invading and usurping these existing colonies in order to reproduce. That always makes me feel a little bit better about it. She doesn't have a choice and she's just gotta do what she's gotta do to feed her, to feed her babies. So the gypsy cuckoo bumblebee, um, this was a bee, it was never super common in Alberta, but it was here. We've got tons of records of it. Uh, it was widespread throughout Alberta, you know, relatively rare, um, but definitely here. More recently, um, we're, we're concerned about this bee because we haven't had any confirmed reports of it since 1983. So that, that's a big deal, right? And, and quite frankly, if this were a mammal, or you know, one of the organisms in our global biodiversity pie chart that we pay a little bit more attention to, there'd be a, a lot more discussion and a lot more things happening to support you know, this species. So, so this is uh, definitely problematic. So this species has declined drastically. So this species, we think it prefers to invade certain nests. We think it, it, it prefers to invade the nest of the Western bumblebee. So, so here's the story. So we'll start at the beginning. So we domesticated the Western bumblebee, the disease spread from the managed bees to the wild bees, and now the Western bumblebee has drastically declined, gone from being the most common to one of the most rare. Um, and then the bee that relies on the Western bumblebee to uh, reproduce has also declined. So again, the, it's just kind of an expansion of that cautionary tale. We've got to be very careful. Um, there are in, unintended consequences to our actions. Okay, so we're gonna switch gears and we are going to talk about solitary bees. 
So, um, so we said there's there's 321 bee species in Alberta. There's 28 bumblebees. The rest are all what we call solitary bees. Even though some of them are social <laughs> and some of them are kind of social, they kind of nest in aggregations, um, but don't really work together. And then some of them, the majority of them are actually truly solitary. So here's, here's you know, a, a generalization of a solitary ground nesting bee life cycle. So at the very top of the slide, you'll see we have an adult female. She's foraging on a flower for food. And you can tell that she has, you know, something going on with her legs as well. So she has special hairs on her legs and she'll groom herself and pack pollen into those hairs to bring back to feed her developing bee. So this bee, she's a ground nesting bee, like I said, and, and she'll excavate a little nest cell out of the soil. Um, these bees tend to prefer sandy soils. Um, so she's excavated the little cell that you can see here. She leaves behind a little ball of pollen and nectar. She then lays an egg on it and she seals up the cell. And most of the time, uh, that, that adult female won't have any other interaction with her offspring. So um, that egg will develop from uh, an egg to a larvae. It's the larval stage that consumes the food. Um, then from a larvae to a pupae and then to an adult. Um, and typically that adult bee will emerge in the following year to start the cycle all over again. So that's kind of a, a generalization of a solitary bee life cycle. Um, and let's talk about some of the different types of um, bees that we have. So we have um, leafcutter bees and we have mason bees and those bees are in the same family and they're what we call stem nesters. So they don't nest in the ground. Rather, they're the ones that will nest in the tubes or the straws. You've probably seen those types of bee hotels. In the wild, they're going to nest in hollow stems of plants. Um, and so leafcutter bees, as their name suggests, they utilize leaves to create nest cells within the tube or the stem. So you can see here in the image, this is a leafcutter bee, and they have these special mandibles that they use to cut out the, the pieces of leaves. Um, they bring it back to their, their nest, which is in a hollow stem or straw or tube. They create the nest cell, they lay the egg, they leave behind the ball of pollen, they seal it up, but um, these bees will, will lay a number of nest cells in a single tube or in a single stem. So the leafcutters use leaves, the mason bees use mud, um, and in fact, they, they need access to like a clay type soil in order to create their little nest cells. But it's the same thing. They create the nest cells, lay the egg, leave behind the pollen, pollen, seal it up, and then move on to the next one. Um, and I should mention too, so there's tons of different species of these different types of bees. And some of them, they're, they're all active at different times throughout the season. So, you know, we've got, um, and, and they're only going to be active for three to five weeks throughout the season as well. So at any given time throughout the growing season, you might find a different assemblage of bees um, in your area, depending on which ones are active at that time. So we have leafcutters and mason bees. We have mining bees. These are very common bees that we have in Southern Alberta. These are ground nesting bees as well. Um, and some of the, the bees that you'll first see in the season, there's a couple of uh, mining bee species that emerge very, very early. We also have plaster bees. These bees are a little bit less common. There's only two main groups um, of this type of bee in Alberta. And plaster bees get their, their wonky name because they actually can, um, they use a secretion that they secrete from their mouth to line the inside of their cell to waterproof it, which is really important um, uh, to, to make sure that that developing bee doesn't get wet because that can be um, uh, really bad for them. And then we have the sweat bees. Well, and, and as you can see, yeah, that they might be my favorite. There's so many of them. They're incredibly diverse. They really do come in all different shapes, colors, and sizes. We have little tiny, you know, metallic green ones. We have brilliant metallic green ones. We have stripy ones. We have black ones. We have big sweat bees. We have little sweat bees. And um, uh, the sweat bees get their, they're, they're ground nesting bees as well. They get their name because um, they tend to land on people's skin and use their proboscis to lap up the salt from your sweat. So, so probably everyone that's listening to this has probably had an interaction with a sweat bee, whether you know it or not. You probably just brushed it off thinking it was something else. So, so what I've got here, um, this is an, a, an example of what you might expect to find in any given area. So these were collected over four days in Blairmore. Um, and as you can see, there's only uh, four or five bumblebees in there. And look at the rest of all of these other bees. This also really shows um, the size of some of these bees. You know, really, um, most people don't 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 look at these and think that they're bees. Um, so the, a, a lot of them look very different to kind of what we think of when we think about bees, even though the vast majority of them um, look that way.
So, uh, so this is what you might expect to find um, pretty much anywhere uh, here in southern Alberta. Okay, so we're going to talk about um, uh, the two things that bees need. So they need food and they need a place to nest. Um, so uh, with regard to food, the bees need flowers that are going to bloom all season long. So we need flowers that are going to support those early emerging queen bumblebees um, that are going to sustain that colony all throughout the growing season until new queens are produced in late summer, early fall. Um, and so that those queens can build up their energy reserve to go at, and hibernate. We also need to make sure there's food available for any of the solitary bees that might be active for their, you know, three to six week period throughout the summer. It's really critical that there's not this big gap in, in, in flowers av available while they're active. As you can see by the slide too, I've got an assortment of flowers. These are all native plants and the plants that I'm showing you here would actually provide a really nice um, flowering phenology or would provide the right bloom times to, to support bees throughout the growing season. But as you can tell, they're, they're, also, they're also all very different. They look different. The morphology of the actual flower is very different. And that's important because our bees are all different. We've seen that through all of these pictures. Um, and in fact, we, we break up our bees into short, medium, and long tongue lengths. And so that's how we, we even, even among our bumblebees. And so you can imagine that if you're, have a, if you're a bee with a short tongue, it might be really complicated, really tricky for you to drink nectar from a flower with a long corolla. So it's important that you're providing a diversity of flowers to support the diversity of bees because they're all different. Um, and the other thing I want to point out here as well is that in the bee world, much like in the human world, we have very picky eaters and we have not picky eaters. <laughs> And so most of our bees are what we call generalists, and those would be the ones that aren't picky. And they'll eat pretty much anything. If there's a bunch of flowers out there, they're going to go, they're going to figure out how to forage on it, and away they go. But there are some bee species that are very picky eaters, and they're what we call specialists. And those specialist bees will only forage on either a single group of flowers or even a single species of flower. Um, and so this is why it's so important to have the native plants that these bees evolved with so that we're not excluding the food resources for any of those um, picky eaters. So the example I'll give you is the, 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 the common harebell, Campanula rotundifolia, which is on the, the top left. Um, and there's a little black sweat bee called Duforia mora, which is I think called the harebell sweat bee. It only forages on common harebell. And so what happens when we you know, create a new subdivision and get rid of the meadow that was there, or if we put, put in a crop field and get rid of the, the grass that was there, we lose some of these species that, that these bee species rely on, and that's really problematic. Um, so next we'll switch and we're going to talk about nesting resources. So um, so again, most of, our ground, most of our solitary bees are ground nesting bees, and they typically will prefer sandy soils, and they need to have access to the soil. So, you know, for so many of us, um, we try to cover up the soil. We, we make sure there's grass or flowers or whatever we need. We, um, we put down mulch and landscaping fabric because if we have bare soil, we're going to get weeds or, or erosion or, or whatnot. Um, so having small areas, especially where you have sandy soils, that these solitary ground nesting bees can access so that they can go um, and excavate their little tunnels to nest in is really, really important. Um, there are also things like rotting logs. You know, you might not think that's important, but there are a ton of, especially the stem nesters, that can either utilize existing beetle galleries, or if the wood is soft enough, they can even excavate um, little tunnels to nest in as well. Um, there's also uh, the stems and, and hollow stems that can be utilized um, as well for the stem nesting bees. So really what we tell folks, if you really want to create habitat for native bees, just incorporate diversity into your yard, throw an old stump there, leave the pile of branches that you've been neglecting to take to the yard waste site. You know, let, let it be a bit messy and you might be surprised at uh, the things that you'll find. So that said, there are a few things that are very popular right now, like bee hotels. <laughs> so you can literally buy these things anywhere. It's insane how these things have grown in popularity over the years. So um, some of these bee hotels are, are okay. Some of them are awful. So, so what we recommend to folks is to just do a little bit of research before you build or buy one of these things. And we have a few tips on what to look for when you're trying to find a good bee hotel. One is keep them small. 
You don't want to have a massive uh, B hotel um, because that is really, you know, like a neon light for diseases and parasites and predators, you know, and, and then they can kind of wipe through the whole thing. So you keep them small. Um, you want to keep your tubes, uh, make them at least six inches in depth. Um, and the reason for that is, um, there's a few things, but one of the, the reasons we think is that the bees will shift to male production of their offspring because they lay males closer to the end because they're more expendable because they're smaller in size. And anyway, we could go into that all day. Keep the tubes six inches in length, uh, in depth, sorry, um, and make sure that it's closed off on the back and that'll avoid predators and parasitoids and stuff from getting in the back door. Your tube diameter should be between one and 10 millimeters. Um, and that's, that's quite a lot of difference, but that'll um, allow different diameter tubes for different nest sizes for different types of bees. Again, we've got over 300, or, you know, not all 300 of them are gonna nest in these tubes, but there's a, a, a big diversity of bees that will nest in them. And so you wanna provide the diversity of tube diameters for them. And you wanna make sure that you're discarding these tubes after use, cause they can build up, you know, mites and pests and, and predators, um, et cetera. So you wanna be discarding or cleaning those after use. So with our bumblebee boxes, so bumblebee boxes are another option. Um, and we actually think that these are great. So um, they're easier to maintain and clean. And a bumblebee box is like a birdhouse, but for bumblebees. So you put it out and it may or may not be colonized by a bumblebee. Uh, we have instructions for building these on our, on our website. Um, like I said, they're really easy um, in the fall, like by about uh, Thanksgiving or Halloween, there's not gonna be any bees living in your bumblebee box. Take the contents, if you had any bees nesting in it, discard them, give it a quick clean, and you're good to go. So it's really nice and easy, and, and we, we definitely think that these are probably a better option for folks. Okay, so this is your second quiz of the day. And so this one, this one's a little bit easier than the first one, but I've got a picture here of two yards. And uh, one of them is very nicely manicured and there's no weeds and there's not a lot happening, but it's beautiful. And the other one, there's so much going on. There's lots of different types of flowers. There's all kinds of things. And so as you can probably tell, the yard on the right is the good bee habitat. Um, and so this, this yard has all kinds of different types of flowers. You can see there's different shapes, different colors. You can't tell from the image, but this yard has flowers that bloom all season long. You can see in the very um, front of the photo that there's a small area of bare soil. That's great for those ground nesting bees. There's some plant species that were selected here that have hollow stems, so that's great. And if you look really close, there's a bumblebee box on a tree in the background. But the main difference between these two yards is that one of them is diverse and complex and the other is not. It's simple. There's nothing going on. There's only one species. It's this yard, it's this grass that's perfectly manicured. Um, so, so, so when folks are trying to create bee habitat, diversity and complexity and incorporating that into your landscaping is what we encourage because that's what mother nature does, right? So we want to mimic nature as much as we can. Okay. So we're going to switch gears and we are going to talk about managed bees. So this of course is a honeybee, and this is probably the other bee that comes to mind when you think about bees. So we have no honeybees native to North America. All of our honeybees were brought here um, uh, you know, several hundred years ago, and they were brought for honey and for wax production. More recently though, they're becoming a really important part of our agricultural ecosystems, and that is for the crop pollination services that they provide. So this is becoming really big business and crop producers will rent honeybee hives and they get shipped around on flatbed trucks to go pollinate the crops. And so here's a map of the annual American honeybee migration. And literally, quite literally, uh, right now, all of the honeybees in the United States are in California pollinating almonds. So they get moved around from all over the US and they go to California and then they get shipped to the next area to pollinate the next crop. So there's a few things that are kind of, you know, this isn't a great practice for the bees, as you might imagine. So they get shipped up on the back of a flatbed truck, moved across time zones, and then they feed off of a single crop species for, you know, four to six weeks. In addition to that, they all come from all over the states and then they go mingle in one area together. So there's a really big potential here for disease transmission. And we're, and we're definitely seeing that that's, that's a problem and that's happening. So there are a lot of diseases. There's a lot of things that impact honeybees and I'm sure you hear about this in the news. So um, what I'm showing you here, these are developing honeybee pupae on the left and you can see the little brown blobs. Those are varroa mites. Um, and these varroa mites can transmit diseases like twisted wing disease, like you can see in the adult bee on the right. 
Um, and that adult bee is not going to be a functioning member of the colony. She can't, um, she can't fly, uh, and she's not going to be very productive. So, so, so these varroa ro- mites are actually a big problem. And in fact, um, now I'm not an expert on this topic, but my understanding is that, you know, we're, we're, um, the treatments that we've been using to kill varroa mites are losing their, their effectiveness and we're running out of options essentially. So there are a lot of things impacting honeybees. So there's these diseases, um, you know, they have mites, pests, pathogens, all sorts of things that are impacting them. There's also, you know, pesticide use, especially when they're in crop fields, that can be really problematic for honeybees as well. And I'm sure, again, you hear every year, especially in the springtime about our overwintering losses of honeybees. Um, But fortunately, you know, honeybees are doing really well. So in Alberta, we have a piece of legislation devoted entirely to honeybees. It's called the Alberta Bee Act. So they have their own piece of legislation. And in fact, we have a really good reputation in Alberta for having healthy, sustainable honeybee populations. And I think a big part of it is because of our our strong legislation. So that legislation requires beekeepers to report back on the number of colonies they have, their status, you know, are they well, are they healthy, are they, did they die in the winter or whatnot, and where they are. So we know every single year how our honeybees are. Um, and we also know that bee, bee, beekeepers can, you know, check on their colonies. They can treat any diseases or issues. They can feed them supplemental food. And, and we get the data every year and we know exactly how they're doing. So for those reasons, and, and the fact that they're a non-native species, they're, they're absolutely no conservation concern. They're doing just fine. And a lot of the reasons why our honeybee colonies die off in the winter is because they freeze to death or they starve to death because they're not super well adapted to live in our climate, right? And those are more of a management concern than they are a conservation concern. That's really what we're trying to get at here. But what about our native bees? So native bees are impacted by all of those same things that are impacting honeybees, but we don't unwrap their hives in the spring and check on them. We don't know immediately how they're doing. In fact, we're really data deficient, like we've talked about before. Additionally, there's no legislation from Alberta, there's no Alberta legislation that pertains to um, native bees. There is a section in the Alberta Wildlife Act for endangered insects, but none are listed. And certainly that's not because they're, they're, they're not (laughs) doing well. Right. So, um, so this is really problematic. Um, uh, In addition to all those things and the data deficiencies that we have and the lack of legislation, we're also increasingly concerned about the impacts from increased competition for limited food resources with managed bees. We have more and more honeybees coming onto the landscape in Alberta every single year. This at some point will become a problem. It may already be, but we don't know. So researchers have been looking at this question, especially recently. There's been a lot of work done on this. So I've got a couple, I've got a study here that I'll, I'll talk about quickly. So these researchers, they estimated the amount of food that a single honeybee colony consumes in a single season. And it's equivalent to the amount of food needed to sustain 100,000 native solitary bee, um, bees. That's a lot. And so, so that's problematic. So then when we look at that and we multiply that by the number of honeybee colonies in Alberta, we know from the Alberta Bee Act that there's 300,000 honeybee colonies in Alberta as of last year, or, or a few more than that. So 300,000 colonies times 100,000 um, uh, native solitary bees, which is the amount of food, it means that we are taking the amount of food uh, from Alberta's environment every year that's going towards honeybees that could sustain 30 billion native solitary bees. So that is a huge number. And that is definitely, that has to raise alarm bells. That's not to say that honeybees have, you know, killed 30 billion native bees. And that's not to say that this matters in every single system. And it certainly doesn't in systems where we're moving honeybees around to pollinate the crops, right? Because we're moving the honeybees there because there's not enough bees to pollinate the crops at the, in that, na- that are naturally there. But certainly this, this, this has got to start mattering at some point. It's probably already an impact in natural ecosystems and our native ecosystems. And this is something that we need to start looking into at the very least. Um, and we need to start utilizing the precautionary principle when it comes to these things, because we cannot have these other um, non-native species and they can't come at the cost of our native bees. So this matters to us in Alberta for a few reasons. So first of all, we have more honeybee colonies than any other province in Canada. We have 41% of Canada's honeybee colonies. That number's doubled since 1986, and it has never, there's never been any consideration for placement or density of hives for consideration of, of native bee conservation, which is a problem. 
This matters because, again, this is a slide I've shown you before, but you know, about half of our bees are either so data deficient we don't know how they're doing, or they're rare or declining. That, that's almost 50%, like that's a big problem, right? So we're, we're data deficient and some of our bees are, are not doing very well, so we've gotta be careful. This also matters because every single person knows the difference between a chicken and a bird and I know, I know chickens are birds, but the difference is that chickens are livestock and birds like this mountain bluebird are wildlife, right? We know that difference inherently almost, but very rarely do we equate that same difference in the bee world. So it's the same difference between honeybees and, and wild bees. So uh, honeybees are livestock and native bees, wild bees are wildlife. And that, if you take nothing else away from this talk today, please take that away. Um, and, you know, it's funny because, you know, along those lines, we never, uh, we don't ever talk about chickens and wild birds in, in the same sentence, ever. But we almost always talk about honeybees and native bees in the same sentence. And that's, that's a bit of a problem. So we really are hoping to, to just make people aware of that difference. And I'll go through a few examples of um, folks not knowing that difference or promoting just a, a mix of both. So one example is the Honey Nut Cheerios campaign. So help bring back the bees. So Buzz the Bee is a honeybee. Of course, it's Honey Nut Cheerios, right? And, uh, and I'm not sure if this has changed, but certainly in the early days, um, you could have read, read this whole entire campaign and not have been aware that honeybees were a livestock species, not have been aware that there's native bees, anything like that. But they're basically saying we need to help save Buzz the Bee, which, who is a honeybee, which is like really not the right message, right? Um, and so there's a few other issues with that campaign, but we, we won't get into that either. Now I have another example. This is a social media post from a very um, prominent conservation organization in Canada. And they say, happy world honeybee day. And they have an image of a bumblebee. <laughs> and they ask if, if you have any wildlife photos like this one. So they think it's a honeybee, even though it's a bumblebee. And then they equate honeybees to wildlife, which is again, just miss, it's just not quite right. And so, um, and this is a, a very prominent conservation organization, right? So we really need to work on just getting that messaging right. We also have researchers. So this is a researcher in the United States doing a TED talk. And he says, every city, every North American city needs healthy honeybees. And his argument is, who else is gonna pollinate the plants in our cities? I would argue that the native bees that are there will do that for us just fine. Um, and certainly even probably better than if they are competing with honeybees for uh, potentially limited resources. And then finally, this is not a honeybee wild bee comparison, but this is a copy of the bees of the world. Now this folks, this is the bee Bible. This is a very important book in the bee world. This is an older version. So you won't find this copy on shelves anymore, but on the cover of this book, uh, the publisher obviously did not consult with the authors because that is a fly on the cover of the Bees of the World book. So again, not that we expect everyone to be a taxonomist, but you know, that just getting that general level of awareness up there is really what we're trying to do. So I, I, when in talking about managed bees, I've only talked about honeybees, but there are other um, uh, managed bee species in Alberta. Um, one is the common Eastern bumblebee, and this is uh, Bombus impatiens. This is the bee that we now use for greenhouse pollination. Remember the story about the Western bumblebee? Well, that bee is declining, it's not doing very well, so now we use the common Eastern bumblebee. It's not native to Alberta. Um, and uh, in the last few years, we've had the first confirmed reports of feral common Eastern bumblebees in Southern Alberta. So, so we really, we have not learned our lesson and we really need to start doing better. So, so this is problematic. And then I have a couple images here. I've got um, the alfalfa leafcutter bee. So we have native leafcutters. This is a non-native species. And then blue orchard, uh, the blue orchard mason bee. So it's kind of a native species. It's a little bit complicated. But these are the bees that you can, you can now go online and buy cocoons of bees and then release them in your yard. Well, you know, so first of all, people that are doing this, um, you know, say you buy alfalfa leafcutter bees, which is a non-native species. And if you think you're trying to do something good for the bees, I mean, that's really, it's really not effective. The other thing is there's a very uh, real lack of regulations on movement of these things and um, checking them for diseases. You could be introducing pests and pathogens. Um, in the case of the Blue Orchard Mason bee, um, depending on which subspecies you get, it may be um, 
a variant that's more well adapted to living on the coast uh, in Vancouver than in Calgary, right? So that's going to, you know, potentially bring in some maladaptive genes. Again, the disease issue is there as well. So just, we just really need to beef up our regulations around this. And we want to create some awareness that, you know, if you want to do something good for the bees, maybe purchasing cocoons is, is not a great conservation practice. It certainly is a cool educational opportunity, especially for children. So I don't want to totally disregard the practice, but I think it's important that people who should, should know that difference. So to sum up, just to compare honeybees and native bees. So honeybee, typically, when we talk about honeybees, we're typically talking about one species. There are other honeybee species out there. When we talk about native bees on record in Alberta, we have 321. Honeybees have 50,000 or so bees in a single colony. Most of our native bees are solitary, but bumblebees have nests of 100 or so, or even there's an example here of a really big colony. Honeybees are non-native, native bees are native, honeybees are livestock, and native bees are wildlife. And again, that's really the take home message there. But, so I've beaten up on honeybees quite a bit, but we still need honey. <laughs> and we still need honeybees. So honeybees are not going anywhere. Our managed bees are not going anywhere. Honeybees are super important to us in our agricultural crop uh, production. We know that, and, and that, that is important. And honeybees are really the only bees we're gonna get honey from. And I have, don't think I've ever met anybody that doesn't like honey. It's a pretty great product. So we still need honeybees, like they're not bad. We just need to be aware that there's some potential impacts and we need to work on mitigating them and, and increasing awareness and doing some more research. That is why we formed the Alberta Native Bee Council. So we established as a nonprofit in 2017, uh, but even though um, some of us have been around doing research and education and outreach for well over a decade, um, and our real goal with the council is that education and awareness piece to, to just create awareness about this issue. You know, there's a lot going on there in the bee world, and it's not always as simple as, as, as we think. So we have a couple initiatives that I'll talk about really quick. Um, so one is uh, we did widespread monitoring of bees in 2018. So we worked with a whole bunch of different groups, Alberta uh, Environment and Parks, Alberta Agriculture and Forestry, Alberta Conservation Association, University of Calgary. Um, we did the mo most robust sampling to date of native bees in Alberta. Um, and um, uh, we found through our survey efforts, um, uh, we added a bumblebee to the species record which is pretty amazing. Um, and it's not because it was a new bee, it's in fact because we've been uh, misidentifying it <laughs> so for a long time. And then we also found the gypsy cuckoo bumblebee. So we found it at, at least one location. Um, and we better understand the distributions of our, our rare and declining species. And we're gonna be able to add to that data deficient group in our pie chart as well. So this is really important. The goal of this is to get a comprehensive inventory of bee species that we have in Alberta and be able to compare that to future research and look at trends and you know see, see, see who's doing well. So we, we did the sampling in 2018. We're still working on a processing and identifying, well, everything is processed, working on identifying things. Uh, we're a volunteer run organization with very limited resources, so it takes us some time, but, um, but there's some good work being done there. The other very exciting program that we have uh, is our Bumblebee Box Monitoring Program. And this is an opportunity where anyone can get involved. So, um, so the Bumblebee Box Monitoring Program, you can build your Bumblebee Box. The instructions are on our website. Put it out in the spring, so you want to have that thing ready as soon as the snow is gone. You want to have your bumblebee box out and ready. Um, and then you just wait. You don't do anything. No peeking. You just wait. And then uh, check it out in the fall. You can get right in there and have a good look and see if it was colonized. And then you report back to us. We'll provide a reminder. We have a really easy to, to, to use form on our website. Um, and, uh, and then that helps us to understand more about bumblebee nesting um, preferences and ecology, et cetera. So this is really a fun way to get engaged and get involved. And I want to say too, you know, um, in Alberta, and particularly in Southern Alberta, we have a long history of doing really good research with bumblebee boxes. Um, in fact, uh, at the Egg Canada Research Center, uh, Dr. Co uh, Dr. Hobbs and Dr. Richards uh, were instrumental in utilizing bumblebee boxes and helping us understand bumblebee nesting preferences. So there's been a lot of really good work done right here in Southern Alberta. And with our bumblebee box pro program as well, I will mention that we've distributed over 1,200 bumblebee boxes in three years, which is amazing. Because again, we're volunteer run with limited resources and we cut out all that wood. So, so this is really great. People, people have been really supportive and it's a really exciting program. 
The other big project we're working on is developing best management practices or mitigation hierarchy for managed bees in Alberta. So we know managed bees are here to stay and that's okay, we need them, but we need to mitigate the impacts from them and learn more about it. So this is something we've been working on for a long time. It's quite complicated. It's taken us a while to find out with, uh, to, to, to determine what, what are the, the best recommendations and how are we gonna mitigate these things. And that's a bit of a work in progress. Um, so stay tuned for that. So what can you do? So I've got four things that you can do right now to help our native bees. One is understand the difference between managed and wild bees. Simply just understanding the difference between the two is a really uh, important aspect of this. Understand that managed bees can negatively impact our wild bees. That's also another really important um, piece of this. It's really easy to create habitat for wild bees by incorporating diversity into your landscaping. There's no one silver bullet when it comes to native bee habitat. It's really that diversity that's the key piece. And you don't need to st you don't need to you know tear up your whole lawn overnight. Just start small and incorporate little things. Even potted plants can help, um, but create that diversity. Focus on native plants. It's pretty it's pretty easy stuff. And finally, you can support the Alberta Native Bee Council. So uh, we're a nonprofit organization, and we offer annual memberships, which can be purchased online. We have some very exciting um, op um, options coming up. We have t-shirts with our new logo on them and mugs. And so those we're gonna have those available here pretty soon. We'll also be launching a new website, um, but right now you can access our existing website at albertanativebeecouncil.ca. Thanks.